everybody. You are at IPDA Twin Cities, and we're going to get started here. Um, before we get going, just a couple quick announcements. Um, we already have November books, so I can tell you about that a little bit. Um, Aaron, Aaron uh, Bannon, who's a regular here, works at W3I, is going to talk about design and uh, monetization considerations for premium games, microtransactions, free-to-play, that kind of stuff. Um, a little loud, a little hot, hot mic. <laughs> Um, and uh, uh, focus on uh, mobile considerations as well. And 90% uh, confirmed, uh, the member project is going to be um, a new guy named Chris that uh, just did a Kickstarter campaign and just kind of give an overview of what that's like. And uh, Chris, you're not here anywhere, are you? Okay. Um, how that went for him. And um, Doug Thorpe's going to be giving a talk at um, the iPhone user group. I mean, Get the summary of that real quick. Um, it also means here at the Nerdery that it's on November 1st, and it's going to be um, his game he's working on, and then a lot of the new features in iOS 5 around matchmaking. And uh, I should know that, but I don't. Um, and and if you haven't been to the iPhone group, it's it's very uh, very hands-on, very focused on here's exactly how the code works, here's what happens, and that kind of thing. Um, Anybody have anything else? That reminded me of one more thing. No? Okay. Well, uh, then first up is Ryan, and he's going to give an update on kind of the, the member games initiative, the IGDATC group, and then the arcade cabinet that's still coming along. Thanks, Zach. I was afraid I was going to have to start that. Uh, hi everybody, I'm Ryan and I'm a game developer. Hi Ryan. Thank you, I was hoping somebody would do that. Um, I do have to say I've been a little bit impact challenged today, or at least my laptop was. I actually lost my hard drive setting up today, so like a Boy Scout, always be prepared. I'm lucky enough to have stolen a laptop from Zach and I think everything will work. But I'm a little bit disheveled now, I'm like, oh, whatever. So. <laughs> Yeah, totally look. My PowerPoint's going to look a bit different than my notes and stuff. So, um, anyway, I'm going to repeat a bunch of stuff from the last couple of weeks, but make it quick for anybody who hasn't seen it before. But uh, what, what happened is that I had like a whole bunch of these ideas in my head that were going on, and, and all these ideas came together, um, and those are the ideas, and they came together to form, like, why don't we as game developers that enjoy doing this stuff, <laughs> why don't we do it together, right? And so um, if you don't know what the Winatron is, it's like an arcade cabinet focused on indie games. So I propose, like, let's make a game for the, for the Winatron. And um, it turns out there were some interested people, and we're doing that. So right now there's only one project, but there's no reason why there couldn't be more, or you know, I don't know. There's nothing stopping it. Um, so here's, here's my arcade prog uh, progress to date. Uh, you can see I built the bottom. and. I'm off by three-eighths of an inch, which is driving me mad, but I'll figure it out. Uh, I was going to show a little viewer, but I lost my laptop, like I said, so I can't do that. But it's big, it's heavy, it's wood. Um, not a whole lot to say about the miniature on 10,000, but uh, it's coming. Zach Johnson is going to help me with that, and hopefully we can do something within the next month. Um, all right, so I'm just going to move on to a demo of the game quick. Um, a lot of things have changed, including we have like a new theme, um, better graphics, but that's arguable, at least the potential for better graphics. <laughs> uh, I go over version control a little bit because it's been an interesting couple weeks with the solution we have. And um, it's Unity, so if anybody's doing Unity free, you probably might appreciate it. Um, and then I'm going to demand that somebody says something. So last month, this is what the game looked like. And it was called Escape from Heck. So last month it was same gameplay and stuff, but the the joke was that you're trying to escape from Satan's evil cousin from hell. And the first one out gets out, and the other one dies. But um, we were trying to find like the, the comedy in that, and that was as far as it went. So we switched it to uh, the corporate ladder. Very similar idea, um, but it's you're starting out in the basement, so to speak, and you're trying to climb up through the buildings 
uh, to get to the top floor and get a promotion through the boss or something like that. So there's a lot of jokes to be had in corporate life, as a uh, Dilbert in office space would demonstrate. Um, graphics. So I, I don't, there's a meme somewhere that says you're, if you're using sprites, you're indie, but I don't know if that's true or not, why not? But I made a little businessy looking guy and I'm, I think he looks okay. But um, the reason I threw this up there is because, does anybody know like a good sprite editor tool that's free because Photoshop is like a giant pain in the butt for that? Anybody ever do this? What tools does anybody use to do? Gail, G-A-I-L, or G-A-L-E, -E. okay. Okay, well thanks, yeah, no, I'm trying to find something. Like, I don't know if you've ever looked up uh, who are the people that make Castle Crashers, but they have videos online of their artist working, and he's literally like, it's like pages on the computer. He's pulling back and forth and watching animation. It's, it's brilliant. But not that this, you know, 24 by 24 pixel sprite's gonna require that same thing, but it is a little difficult. All right, um, how many people have had experience with Unity? Are there some? Um, anybody do version control with it, other than through the asset server? Asset server? Have you found any solution other than that? We, we, we have Unity Pro at work and SVN, and that works pretty good. But Unity, just the free version, who doesn't support it, um, it's a nightmare. It's, you, don't, you don't do it. I mean, it's one thing to, to manage your code and everything in a Unity project, but there's so many extra files that say this thing is related to that thing and it's all like internal. And as soon as that breaks, you either have to note it and keep rebuilding it if you're trying to rebuild your project or um, make Unity packages. It's sort of ugly. So what we did for this group of at times four uh, programmers, though one of us hasn't actually opened the Unity project, I don't think. Um, <laughs> As we started, we were using SVN on certain things, such as scenes and code mostly, and a few art assets. But otherwise, we're all working in Dropbox together. So Dropbox, if you don't know, is kind of like this, uh, almost like you're sharing a network drive together. Um, this is really good and, and really bad. Um, <laughs> it, it works, but we learned a lot of things along the way that there are things that you just don't do. And one of those is working the project at the same time. So as long as you're not in the project at the same time, things won't randomly rescale or lose all their links to everything or just not open anymore. So we learned that the hard way. Um, but eventually, other than that, it's actually working out quite well. Um, it is, it, you basically do need to be on Skype the whole time though, or something similar chatty to coordinate, like can I open it now, can I open it now? Um, Still looking for a better way. I hear Unity 3.5 will support version control, but I don't, I'll believe it when I see it. And yes, for the record, uh, Jar Jar was a bad idea. <laughs> um, hopefully you recognize that. I'm gonna bring down Ryan, because like I said, my hard drive crashed, or I should say my laptop fell in my setup today and I lost my hard drive, so the arcade controller is out, but Ryan is the, come on around, Ryan. He's the, uh, the programmer here. He actually came up with the game concept and stuff, and so he's sort of getting the, um, I'd almost call it lead. But he knows the keyboard shortcut stuff, so yeah, they'll do that down the No, no, the, the link on the page won't work because that's not, doesn't do that anymore. So bear with me a second. Was there so. Okay, so this is going to show a lot of the changes we did. All right, so um, I don't know if how many I don't know how many people saw my presentation last month or lot or not, but it felt like it took a really long time to play. Some of those things that we've improved are it does play a lot faster and there's some more interesting graphics. So uh, one of the things you'll notice is uh, there are power-ups now. It's a, 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 like a freezing power-up. It basically stops the blocks from falling.
That's me. Uh, another thing that happens is if you get a large number of match, I believe it's four or more of the same color at the same time, it will uh, impact the other player. I believe it will cut out the floor beneath them. Something like that there. Yep, there it goes. I'm going to blame the keyboard for my poor performance here. <laughs> Sprites now as well. I think I've mentioned everything now. We have a pretty pitching background. We got blimps. And clouds, yep. happy that that all worked out, although well, I'm saddened that I'm out of laptop. Um, uh, so it's now your turn. So somebody is going to say something or next time I'm going to show a show of Jersey Shore. <laughs> yeah. I just asked the guys to please find some sounds. I have no idea. Any idea what they are? If you have a copy of Half-Life 2, you have access to all the game sounds. Nice. Is that what you're using as Half-Life 2 sounds? Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? I, I don't think that the bright colored rainbow box works as well. Uh, no, 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 no. I, yeah, I should have mentioned that. The, the blocks were just... They, they need a lot of work, right. Yeah, no, the color is not right. We're working on trying to get to an office theme, and so it's trying to break that three-dimensional look and never, I spent more time on my little business guy than I did on the blocks, so. That's not a bad idea. What do you think of that? Climbing ladder blocks, so you could break them or you could climb them, like they'd be intermixed with the. Right, okay. No, I like that. It frees both players, or is it freezing both players? It might be. I'm not sure. Um, it's possible we were both getting it near around the same time. I, I wasn't paying much attention to uh, his gameplay, but I'll, I'll, we'll look into that. Um, Oh, at the same time in the same space? That's, that's, um, that's not a bad idea. Yeah, we could try that out relatively easily, I think. Um, I do like that. I mean, one thing we were going for was that um, sort of single player but playing the same game. So I don't know if you noticed, but the boards are exactly identical in their block setup and stuff. It's just a matter of how you use it. But I, I, I like that idea, actually. At the same time, there might be some interesting things to try there. Yeah, we need to work on some sort of framing and stuff. There's, there's, we've done a little bit of prototyping. Um, what he said was that the, 
it's hard to see the differences in backgrounds and stuff. So, like uh, the the image from the, the the last month's demo, you can see there's that like border that really divided it. Whereas, yeah, we don't have that same thing yet for the new theme. But it, there should be something that, if it is split, it should be divided absolutely. So I think you tons of stuff. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, yeah, we're looking for power-up ideas. I mean, we have a, we have some in mind, but um, like the freeze one, I wasn't had never even thought of, and Ryan just threw it in there quick because we had special blocks already, and that actually makes, at least in our playtesting, maybe not tonight, but our plays, it makes the actual game go a bit faster. So, which is nice because if you can get that feeling that the other person is outrunning you or something like that. Oh yeah, that's interesting. Oh, like something comes in the way so you can't see what you're doing? Okay. Oh, a TPS report pops up. All right, brilliant. I like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Definitely that something like that needs to be in there. Yep. Like you get the assignment from the guy who's cutthroat who's like managed to pass off his work to somebody else. I like that. So yeah, you have to fill out a form or write a memo or attend a meeting would be good too. You just have to sit there and wait. <laughs> Oh, that's <laughs> I like that, yeah. Instead of a car, it's a printer that you're beating up. I like that. Yeah. Um, it's, it's funny because we had like I had mentioned like I would like to do some sprite stuff because I think it'd be kind of fun. I like minimalistic stuff, and so I mentioned it, and they the guys they are like, yeah, sure, that'd probably work because no no artist has stepped forward, so I stepped forward, um, and so. It, Somebody posted on Twitter like, uh, hey, I've made this Google document of all the possible sprite managers in, in Unity. And so I quick tweeted it and I said, good timing. And then next thing I know is Ryan tweets, I wrote my own sprite manager. So, <laughs> so it's relatively simple, yeah. It's not doing a whole lot of things that the other ones do, but it's also, we're not doing, it's not very hard either. So, or at least the stuff we've tried to do isn't that hard. Yes. Oh, a, a coffee pot power up. All right, that's a good idea. Yeah, sprite something. Like. I have yes. Um, yeah. Is that the same one that it's like Sprite Manager 2 and Sprite Manager 1 is free? Yeah. Same one? Um, yeah, I'm looking more for like a tool to help create the sprites, I guess. Something to help me animate them or artistically make them. Um, a, uh, it's it's Pixie? Pixie? Okay. Pixin. Pixin is a sprite creation tool yeah, or something like that? Oh, yeah? Something sprite on. It's literally called sprite something. Okay. <laughs> okay, cool. Yeah, I don't know if it's my Google is just messed up or something, but I searched for like sprite graphics or something like that, and I came up with all sorts of like Windows, uh, you know, like 1990, 32-bit. Like you can just tell they are old. Like I don't, don't think so. But yeah, I'm just using Photoshop to do it. And we're just making. You know, typical stretched maps or whatever. Oh, okay. So yeah. So like, the the you could maybe force that onto the other player that they only can break a certain color block during a certain time, or maybe it could cycle, like just oh, yeah. rotate on them, and they they kind of have to either get to it or wait for the next one. Okay. Have to hit it twice. Okay, that's that is what you said, right? Which would actually that might not be a bad idea, considering a lot of times um, I know when I play, I jump a lot and try to break blocks, and um, 
if you had to do that twice, then, then that could be a problem. <laughs> um, there, so uh, I don't know if you noticed, but there's like some, still some, a little bit of bugs in the, in the falling block code, which um, are frustrating at times because they just kind of move around on you. But because of the way it was implemented, it's, you can see that the blocks don't all necessarily fall together. And you can actually hop between them as they're falling. And that was sort of an unexpected, fun thing that we found in that. So I thought that was actually pretty interesting because now, you know, if they all fell at exactly the same time as one big clump, you kind of just have to wait or jump and pound into it or something like that as they fall. But because they're falling individually, you can actually at times stair step between blocks or something like that. Oh, okay. Oh, so, yeah, actually something to make it so maybe you don't want to get a buff at some point. They go for them anyway? Okay. I like that. All right. No, uh, roulette wheel buff is an interesting idea. Okay. Yeah, I, I do like the idea that there'd be negative ones, too, that could impact you in a way that might make you, say you're ne near the top, you don't necessarily want to grab the the buff because it could hurt you, say, knock you down three stories or something, I don't know, but whatever they end up being. All right. Anybody else? These are all great. I hope somebody's writing them down. Or I got it on tape, so it'll probably be okay. Yes? What do you want to do with the really to down to the top? Oh, okay, so I didn't mention it. So this, <laughs> it's interesting you would say uh, a different mode where you try to go down instead of go up, because um, have you ever heard of a game called Mr. Driller? Okay, so Mr. Driller is that game. So this is like the variant of the game where we decided to go upwards. <laughs> right, actually, yeah. So, very excellent thought, though. <laughs> oh, so you're, you're drunk. Yeah, all right. Yeah, you spiked the other guy's coffee with some vodka or something like that. And he, of course, has to drink it. There's just no choice. <laughs> Happy hour, yeah. There has to be like a server crash or something too where everybody just has to wait. Maybe the power goes out or there's a fire drill. I don't know, these are all popping up now. Fire drill would be good. Or new phone systems installed. Corporate restructuring, that would be good. A reorg. <laughs> okay. I like that. Glass ceiling is a good one. Okay. Red tape ties them. Ties them up. Okay. Yeah. One of the suggested variants I had was that it was like IT based. I, I can't remember the show. There's a British show. It's it's basically about the IT IT crowd. There we go. Yeah. It's about IT people. Um, but the beginning intro, like it starts out at the top and then it flies down in this really neat sequence down to the basement where the IT trolls live, right? And um, it, it's a pretty funny show and I was wondering if there wasn't something we could quick capitalize on on like the IT thing. But I think it could probably be both, actually. So. Anybody else? More, more, more? Okay, so you like go to the bathroom or something? Yeah, bathroom. <laughs> Gotta climb out of the bathroom. Or some, or a conference room, or something. Yeah. Unpaid leave. <laughs> Unpaid leave. Okay. Yeah, I wonder if there could be like a layoff or something like that. What's that? Workers' comp. Yeah. <laughs> For low. Oh, yeah. Did you have an idea? I just got one suggestion. At least charge at least a buck. Charge a buck. Yeah. Well, um, as much as I think I would love to put a game out there that charges um, the whole Winitron concept, uh, which I think is brilliant, is it's free to play. So they will not let you have their software if you say they're, you're going to put quarters in the machine or anything like that. So you, you literally make an arcade machine and stick it out there and people can play whatever they want. So. That isn't to say we couldn't sell the game as well. Like, Cannibalt is on the Winitron, and it costs a buck, I think, on iPhone or something like that. But right now, I think the little group that we have, we're just really interested in, in the whole, or at least maybe I'm speaking for everybody else, I'm really interested in like the whole 
process of it all and working as a small little team or something like that. So, um, any other ideas? That was great. There won't be any Jersey Shore next month, I promise. Um, one thing, though, I'm, I'm betting you guys read it. Um, so the Winatron, if you build a cabinet, you get the, the honor of naming it. And um, most places do, like, Winnie comes from Winnipeg. So, and um, Tron, because there was, like, a, some other Canadian effort of making an arcade cabinet. So they called it the Winatron. The, tr the Toronatron, there we go. So um, the Winatron kind of spawned from that. And then they, um, there's, they give out the software and all the games and everything, as long as you're willing to make a cabinet, put it out there where people can play it. And uh, they let you name it whatever you want, but they ask that you put, you know, as a member of the Indie Arcade Network, and that's fine. Most places call it, you know, like Winatron, Nebraska, or whatever, or Winatron, New York. Um, but some places, like we were thinking maybe the Minitron, where they take the, the yep, Minnesota, right, Mini. Um, but if anybody has any ideas for an interesting name, you know, please, please let us know. Um, all right. What's that? Um, oh, if you have an idea for a logo for the Minitron, yeah, why not? Um, yeah, I mean, anything. All right, this is a totally open project, so you're invited to, to please come be part of it. Um, you know, how, however it would, even, even if you just want to listen in or be a part of it or whatever, I mean, there's no, there's no rules here, so feel free to suggest any suggestions or anything you have. Um, there was one other thing, and I had suggested this, but never got around to finding the time to actually do it, but how many people would be interested in, like, a mini game jam? And the idea of a mini game jam would be that it's like only an evening thing or something. You're not actually doing the whole 24 or 48 hour thing or something like that. And maybe it's a bunch of them, but... All right, well, that's great. That's, like, worth doing then. So I will... Who wants to volunteer to do that? No regard. <laughs> All right, I'll uh, task one of you in private. Okay. That's awesome. Yeah, I, I had looked into some places now. Um, Chatterbox is where we've done things in the past, and they've been good to us for letting us use that back room, and they have internet. So that was like one of my suggestions um, as a potential. But and I also looked into that Coco, it's called, the, the, it's sort of spendy unless you're a member sometimes, unless they volunteer the meeting, the rooms. Clockwork? I'll have to check the nerdery's schedule. <laughs> All right. Okay. Sure, actually, yeah. I, well, I looked into it, and I thought, I don't know if you guys know what Coco is. It's like a community sharing. Like, if you don't have business space, you rent it from them. I'm like, that's awesome. And then, like, one little desk is, like, $700 a month or something. And I'm like, ah, you know, that's fantasy destroyed. All right. And that's, that's all I got. So thank you very much, guys. Gals. Thanks for the laptop pack, too, by the way. Isn't that British office? I don't, I don't know what the balls reference is, to be honest. Um, my, uh, okay, so me and my buddy were working on a, a game, an Android game, and I talked about it on the podcast. It's a, a pinball game, but we were under NDA. We couldn't say anything about it. We couldn't even say we were making a pinball game. So we just always referred to it as the balls game. And, and my buddy sent me that picture and said, yeah, this is what we're working on. So. How do you log out? Sign out. All right, we're going to do a short break. Um, let's say uh, exactly six minutes. And uh, we'll get Gravik all set up here and uh, get them rolling. They've got a lot of games to go through, so we'll get that going as fast as we can. Um, bathrooms are still over that way, and more soda if you need it. So see you back here in a few minutes.
Okay, we're going to get rolling here. Uh, these guys have presented a while back, um, and they've been real busy, so they got a huge backlog of stuff to present, so they're going to be blazing through a bunch of games. But uh, this is Ty and Matt from Gravik. So we have uh, quite a variety of stuff to present, and we, we kind of have a problem because Ty and I were like, what are we going to talk about? And then we kind of both went off and made our slides, and we combined our slideshow, and we realized about 30 minutes ago that our slideshow is stupidly long. And so we're going to just blaze through some of it and um, ask questions as, as we move along because uh, we're going to be going through a bit about Unite 2011, which Ty attended. And so I guess any questions on that would be while we're presenting that. And then we're going to go on to our future projects and our past projects that we've been working on the past year. Start with Ty and Unite. Right, so uh, did anyone go to Unite this year, a couple weeks ago? No. Did anyone see the keynote? Jeez. Did uh, did anyone see the keynote? No. Um, okay. Well. Uh, <laughs> so um, yeah, Gravek is talking about Unity again. Um, awesome engine. Uh, yeah, really. <laughs> so um, just a couple things about the conference. This is the biggest one yet. There's 1,200 people there. A couple years ago, it was like 350 or something, so there's grown like crazy. Um, the sessions were a lot more diverse, more about game uh, design and art and every everything. Um, the keynote, the second half of the keynote, um, Dave Brevik talked. He founded Blizzard North, talked a lot about Diablo and stuff. It was pretty, pretty sweet, so it's definitely worth going to their site and, and seeing what he had to say. Um, I also talked on an artist panel there, and I was kind of hungover from the Unity party, so if you happen to see that link, I, don't click on it. <laughs> um, so, you know the. Yeah. Okay. That. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, um, Unity 3.5 is coming out. Um, it has some rad features. I'm just going to kind of fly through this. If you want to check out the keynote, they explain a little more. Um, so, they're they're doing analytics now, built into Unity with heat maps and stuff. Um, they're also hosting it, I guess. Not really meant much detail on that. Um, they also have their social API, Game Center, and Facebook all built in. Um, their scene merging is way better, along with the cache server. I don't know if you guys, it's probably a, that's a, um, the uh, asset server thing, isn't it? Caching? Yeah, so you don't have to sit and wait 20 minutes for all your stuff to re import when you change um, platforms. Yeah. <laughs> Been there, yeah. Um, Inclusion calling has definitely improved. Um, they have a level of detail support, so it's all visual sliders now. So um, the uh, mesh and texture MIP, you can edit like how far and see previews of uh, how it's going to render in the game. Uh, their pathfinding is freaking amazing. Um, it's all automatic nav mesh generation. You put your guys in, and it reads all of your geometry and like builds um, pathfinding for you. Um, the crowd simulation, I thought, from the video rivals like Assassin's Creed. It's, it's pretty crazy. Uh, GPU profiler to see if you have any shaders that are eating up your game performance. <laughs> so <laughs> there's these new things called light probes. Um, <laughs> they're automatically generated tetrahedral nodes which pick up surrounding light from your light maps and interpolate the colors and levels onto your dynamic objects as it collides with them. So it's all baked in, like all your, if you have a box that flies through, um, it's going to pick up the light from your light map, not actual light sources, so it's like super fast. No questions on that because I barely understand how that works. And there's a little picture of it. Um, it's really cool though, I did check it out. Uh, but the, the coolest thing I thought was the shuriken particles. Um, I don't know how many people work with Unity's you know, particle system, but this is way more um, user friendly. It's all visual, curve based editing. Um, it's all live, so you have your simulation playing, and you can actually stop and scrub the simulation and edit, um, edit the particles during the simulation in real time. It's, it's insane. Um, they also have uh, mesh particles now, too. So uh, last thing that they said also is that um, your Unity project will now be able to run as a Swift file in the browser, which is crazy. And um, that's coming soon. 
So that's Unity 3.5. Definitely uh, check it out. Um, didn't really give a release date, but uh, if you're a Unity user, you definitely want to upgrade. If that, if you have Unity If you have Pro, I, I assume it would be. I think they all have been. It, they kind of touched on at the end that it's it, that putting it to Swift files just like another platform, like right in Unity. I, you know, I think you might check out the end of the keynote for more info on that. Sorry, I could barely hear you guys out there. Um, I, uh, that's like, uh, that's as much as I really know. <laughs> I was just passing on some awesome info. So if you want to go deeper, definitely check out the, the extended details on the keynote on the uh, Unity, uh, Unity's website. So, um, yeah, here's kind of what else uh, we've been up to. So um, one of our, our most famous, most well-known games was Ski Ball for the iPhone. We decided to uh, re-release it as Arcade Ball for the Android because we weren't able to acquire the rights for the Android platform. So we, uh, we basically reskinned it, made it legal. Hopefully uh, Ski Ball license holders won't yell at us. And it's in a soft launch right now, just kind of testing the waters with our first Android game. And so far it's been going okay and we'll show you a little bit later um, just how that's going money-wise. Um, we'll compare the free to and, and paid versions and then also I'll talk a bit about what we plan to do with it to, to get it out of soft launch mode and actually hopefully make, make money. Yeah, there's just some screens from the Android Marketplace. There's a free and paid version on there. Um, so yeah, if you saw Ski Ball for it, it's uh, Ski Ball. Uh, on the Green was another uh, game that we worked on this year. Um, started off as just like a prototype of a simple flick mechanic, flicking a golf ball. Um, eventually turned into a uh, full-on multiplayer uh, game of characters and um, power suits. You can get there's like a bird suit, um, all these different suits that help you Try to uh, get hold in one. Um, we used uh, Game Center for real time multiplayer. I think uh, I'm going to elaborate on that. The, it's uh, it, it's kind of it's a, it's a mixture of turn based and real time. You can you can hit and then you can kind of see what the other person is doing as you play. Pretty interesting. Um, also, be um, releasing that on some different platforms using Union. Uh, there's a little sheet to that. We we have some of these games out built out too. Um, if anyone wants to check them out after after the talk, one of Gravex's first games that we created was uh, RC Laser Warrior. It was actually entering a competition, one of Unity's first uh, game development competitions, and uh, we released it on Shockwave.com as a web game. And we decided, you know, we have this racing game. Let's uh, let's revamp it a little bit and um, try out the Mac Store. And so that's that's about one bug away from being placed on the Mac Store, and uh, I guess we'll see how that does holiday season. It's uh, it's a pretty standard racing game, except your RC car, and you've got nukes and lasers and nitros that blow each other up, and it's pretty fun. And uh, if I was thinking ahead, I would have put a demo on here to, for everybody to check out, but uh, maybe next time. So um, that's kind of a rundown of 
some of the projects we've done. The next project I want to tell you about is uh, Jump Dudes. But before we get into that, um, Jump Dudes is kind of a different strategy uh, money-wise uh, monetizing it than, than a lot of our past projects. And uh, a lot of our strategy that we're, we're going to be implementing in Jump Dudes is from stuff we've learned with Skee-Ball and uh, just earning money from different streams of revenue in Skee-Ball. So I thought um, it might be worth going through some of how, we, how money was made with Skee-Ball and what worked out and what didn't. Um, and I, I just made some graphs. I, I, I like analyzing all the data from all the different places and uh, checking it out. So first I'll explain to you the different SKUs we have out there. We have um, normal ski ball for the iPhone. That was the original released in 2009, I think, at just 99 cents. So it was originally built without any in-app purchasables. Um, the only way to make, for us to make money on that was 99 cents for the initial download. Um, a couple years later, we released uh, a $2 version for the iPad. And then uh, at around the same time we released the iPad version, we um, threw some in-app purchasables in there. Kind of the idea of Skee-Ball, um, there's, there's two goals. One is to get the best score you can, and then another is to earn tickets so you can buy prizes. And these prizes are just stupid little trinkets that honestly never really had much much value, but as the game got older and we upgraded it, we ended up throwing in uh, customizable lane skins and balls. So you could customize the look of your lane and ball, and it, some of them looked pretty cool. I guess people really liked the balls especially because we had some particle effects and some uh, trails on the balls, and uh, according to our user reviews, that ended up being a pretty big hit. And so then we decided uh, to put an in-app purchasable in there for ticket packs, kind of a saves uh, pay dollar, it saves you a little bit of time earning these, these uh, the tickets on yourself. Instead you could just spend a dollar, buy 20,000 tickets and, and end up uh, customizing your balls and your lanes a bit more. So that's kind of the, in a nutshell, how we monetize Ski Ball. Last February we released uh, Ski Ball Free. That's our, did, what, what did we name the octopus? I don't know. It was actually quite interesting trying to get the octopus in the game because Free vs. was like, that's just stupid, guys. That, that's, a, that's a ridiculous octopus. But we ended up actually getting it in the game. Pretty proud of that. So with the, the Free version, we ended up monetizing it a variety of different ways with mob clicks. So it's ad supported. We have an ad up all the time. It ends up working pretty well because it's pretty non-intrusive. And with the, uh, the way mob clicks works is if you swipe the swipe the game to launch a ball, even if you accidentally hit the mob clicks banner, it doesn't open up, so it's not it's not too annoying. Um, another thing that we started with was the tap joys. Is anybody familiar with what tap joy is? I can give a quick rundown of what that is. What um, it, it does a lot of stuff. They're, they they offer services like mob clicks, but probably the most unique thing about tap joy is uh, they have an offer wall. And so a ski ball you play a game, you earn tickets, you buy some of those tickets. Well, what this offer wall does is you can open up the offer wall and it's like, download uh, Mob Wars 3 for free and get 400 tickets. So it's, it's essentially a way to get more tickets um, for the users, but also we get a small amount of money for each, each time somebody downloads one of these apps to get the free tickets. Um, the iPhone... Uh, the Apple has since disallowed the TabJoy offer wall on the phones. We are using it on the Android version though, and it, it's actually working fairly well. And then, um, I forgot to mention this in the paid version too, uh, we, we have the tickets, I, I did mention that, but we also have prize packs, and so not only can you buy tickets, but you can buy additional prizes that'll show up in the store that you can buy. And we had different themes, we had a bling pack, a toy pack, a food pack, and um, an adventure pack. So we had, in the end, a wide variety of different ways that this was making money. And so I'm just going to kind of go through and um, compare how the different, uh, how, how, the, how they compare, really. 
this ended up being a bit smaller, I'm sorry, but uh, if you can see on the first graph, the blue line is the original version, and, the, and this is the, the first graph is the, the amount of revenue we made. Um, the free version, you can see, actually made more than the original version. And this graph is starting in February when we first released the free version. And uh, you can see it follows a pretty nice pattern that we can kind of estimate and predict what future sales are going to be if we never touch it again. But I guess the thing to get from this graph is that the free version surprisingly made more money than the paid version. And uh, Freeverse, our publisher, was very confident this would happen, but uh, to us it was just uncharted territory. And, and you know, I wasn't convinced we were actually going to make more money on the free version, but I guess the proof is in the numbers right here. And you can see coming in last place is the HD version. Um, there just simply aren't nearly as many iPads out there. Matt, where in the charts was the free verse paid version during that time period? Was it? So at the beginning of the graph, the free version uh, was number one for about four days. The, the free charts are really volatile. So you're lucky to be up there for um, for more than a day, really. If you look at the paid charts, I mean, Angry Birds has been up there since freaking two years ago, but or whenever it was re released. But with uh, the, f the free charts, you'll notice there's, there's never a game up there for more than a week. Um, but anyway, to answer your question, the free version was around number one at the very top of that peak. And then the paid version was, I think, around number 40. And the uh, HD version, the HD, the HD version never really caught on as well as the other versions. So I don't, that, that was probably around 100 or 200 or somewhere. Um, another lesson we learned was that in-game currency really, really sells well. So I, I have a breakdown. Like I said before, we had tickets and prize packs. Now let's just look at the two top bars, and that's just, we're comparing the two in-app purchasables from just the paid version, the two top bars. You can see tickets way outsold the prize packs. And these, these are all four prize packs wrapped into one. And so we, we had a total of five in-app purchasables, and tickets just dominated. And now, um, looking at the bottom three bars, that's for the free version. You can see that even though we had way, way more users for the free version, I mean, I think over over the two or three years that Ski Ball has been out, two years, we, we've accumulated about three million, four million paid users. And when the free version came out, it only took about two months to meet that number. And so we had about 700,000 downloads in a single day for the free version when it was number one. And so this gives you an idea of, of how more likely somebody is to, to buy something in the app after if you bought it to begin with, if that makes any sense. Um, does that make sense? <laughs> You said you made more money on the free version, but the bar, but at least for the in-app purchases, the, the bars are a lot shorter, so Scott's pointing out. Hello? Hello? So the, the question was, um, yeah, I just said that we made more money on the free version, but this does not reflect that. And uh, I guess we're just looking at the in-app purchases here. I guess looking at the next slide, or how about how about all of the income streams compared? We'll, we'll skip up a few. Ads are really what made it money. Um, if we compare every single stream of income that we had, um, I still have TabJoy in there. In the month of February, uh, March, that was actually significant. That was around the same as the, like even the paid version. But uh, as you can see here, the Advertisement just dominated. Uh, we really underestimated how much ads actually made in these applications. And um, this is actually reflected in Arcade Ball, too, where we have a free and a paid version. And the most money we're making is from uh, mob clicks, which um, it, it just really surprised me. So, go question. back. Um, 
Well, I'm working with a mobile developer on something, and we're doing the same sort of idea of, of you know in-app purchases for stuff and whatnot, uh, more levels, things like that. And one of his suggestions is um, that the free version comes with ads, but you can actually buy removing the ads. Have you guys done that or, or thought yeah. about it, or is that an option in any of your stuff? It's um, that's actually a really good question. That's something he asked if uh, having an in-app purchasable for removing ads is a good idea. And that's something that we've been wondering ourselves. And in one of our next projects, we'll probably try that out. Um, our publisher has said that it, it doesn't do the best. But you know, my opinion is it's another stream of revenue. So no, why not try it out? Unless it hurts your ads. But I mean, if somebody's willing to pay for it, they're probably not willing to click on ads. So Yeah. And um, I guess one, one thing that we can really learn from, from this, at least from Skiwell, is that currency is a much more valuable in-app purchase to have than content. Um, people really didn't care about at unlocking additional content. And I, I think part of it might be the psychology of if we give them tickets, they have a lot more power. They, they can do a lot more with that and indiv individualize the game with that versus content, you're, you're more or less forced to get a specific type of content that you're buying. And okay, so we we have a variety of ads, um, and here's a chart that actually shows we we use full screen ads and banner ads, and uh, the I ad in there, um, that's actually we can lump that into banner ads. So with the banner ads, it's not intrusive. It's just kind of there. You can honestly, I just zone out uh, banner ads, and I don't know why people actually pay for them <laughs> because because I think they're universally ignored. And then there's the annoying full screen ads, which we did have, but uh, Freeverse was really campaigning for full screen ads, and we were very hesitant to because we just hate the idea of intruding your experience. Um, so we ended up kind of compromising and. Um, when you're at the title screen, you can go into the store or your loot to buy or view your prizes. And when you're, and, and after you're done buying or viewing your prizes, going back to the title screen, every third time we had an, a full screen ad pop up. So we, we tried kind of mitigating the intrusiveness by having it after a rewarding experience, so it, it doesn't prevent people from going into the store or the loot. Um, so I guess that's one thing that we did, and then the other thing is just one out of every three times. Um, you can see, though, that full screen ads, for as little as we had them in the game, they actually make a significant amount of money. And so from a, from a game design perspective, I hate them. From a business pers perspective, they shouldn't be, they should be considered, at least. It, uh, I just want to say, too, it took us a lot of fighting to actually put ads in our games. Uh, Took a lot of back and forth, and should we do it? I, you know, is it the only way we could do it is if it was non intrusive? And and with our game design, it actually completely wasn't. So we, you know, we gave it a shot and paid off. Yeah, I'm actually pretty surprised that revenue by ads is just high as it is. Yeah. Because it's just not a lot of So I guess there's a, there's a couple things I can comment on that. Uh, I think first of all, um, well, I can show you some more of that information. I don't have it with me right now. I can dig it up. Uh, one of the nice things about mob clicks is that it uses a really long list of, of ad vendors. And then it chooses the ones that are making the most money at the time. And so it really does a good job of optimizing your ad revenue. Um, compared to just going with a single ad vendor. And then the other thing that I'd like to note is that Skiball was not originally made with in-app purchasables in mind. And I think that if we had designed the game around in-app purchasables, we would be making more money on in-app purchasables than ads. Um, 
if that answers your question. Can you explain a little bit about tickets? Because I don't really understand what you do with tickets. It's, it's just like at Chuck E. Cheese when you were a kid, or you know, if, if you still do it now. I, I like Chuck E. Cheese. All right, yeah, so you, I, you, I, you, you earn the little frog that jumps or whatever, OK. Um, <laughs> so, so it's the same thing where you, I mean, ski ball, to me, ski ball is always one of the best games to go to at the arcade because it gave you the most ticket to coin ratio. Um, you know, I, I, was, I was actually never much of a Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle or X-Men you know, arcade game because they never gave you tickets. What's the point? Um, I, I, was, I was always going for that, that awesome like mini TV or, or Mega Force. Anybody remember Mega Force? That was like the, the best die cast army toys ever. Am I alone in this? Come on, anyone? Lame. Um, anyway, so, so you roll the ball, get a score, get tickets. With those tickets, you redeem prizes at the front desk. And usually there's stupid things like, you have a glow-in-the-dark sucker, or um, you know, whatever else you can buy. Sure. I don't know if anybody actually got cool stuff. I, I think they all just got conned and like, walked out with a little uh, snap bracelet or something. It's, it's the idea of it, yeah. That is. So the tickets are, the tickets are, the tickets are, win tickets for, yep. for playing. And, and it's essentially a currency then to buy little prizes. and. You, and, that, um, that's the question I'm wondering is what do you do with those prizes? Okay. Do you just have like a virtual little bookshelf or something? That you yeah, it's a, it's a virtual or? bookshelf. And, and this is why I say that our game is not very well designed to make money as with in-app purchases because these prizes don't actually do anything. They don't affect the core game mechanic until we added balls and lanes and then it affects the visuals of the game. Okay. So do you, do you think that's what people are buying tickets for then, is for the things that actually I, impact the game in some way? I, I don't have any hard data, but I am willing to bet money that 90% of the people who buy tickets do it so that they can get balls and lane skins. Okay. Um, this graph is a bit different than the others, and it's, it's kind of hard to explain. Essentially, the blue line uh, is... Uh, the drop-off rate of number of downloads. And so at the beginning of the blue line, that's when we are number one in the free chart, and it drops really quickly. Um, but you can see with the green line, that was our revenue stream, all of our revenue combined. And you'll see that the green line didn't drop as fast as the blue line. And you can gather some information from this. I guess one thing is retaining users pays off. So just because they're not downloading anymore doesn't mean that you're not making money, especially with ads, and um, that's something with Ski Ball too that we're in progress. That I, I really want to see that green line get higher. I want to really retain users more. So uh, I said I'd talk a little bit about our Arcade Ball. Um, still in soft launch mode. It's not branded, so it's not selling near as well. Um, doesn't have any in-app purchases because Apple makes it easy. Android does not. Um, the paid version is 99 cents, and the free version, the two streams of income are Mob Clicks and Tap Joy. And <laughs> kind of here's a, here's a quick breakdown. You can see free is making much more than the paid version. And I, and I would imagine this, uh, this same graph could apply to, the same trend would apply to the iPhone store, the iOS store. And then uh, the pie chart just shows how much Mob Clicks is making compared to TapJoy. Do you mind sharing how many sales you've had? Yeah. Uh, I think we have um, like 100 downloads of the paid version, and uh, I think we have about 10,000 downloads of the free version, somewhere around there. So, I mean, it's I can't complain because it's certainly making money. This was a total experiment with Android. I, I had no idea going into it what to expect. I think um, right now it's only in the Google um, the Android marketplace, but I think if we expand to a couple different um, marketplaces, the Amazon and then there's Gitjar and this, this other one, Hanster, that I think just got bought up by Opera, I think once we kind of diversify where Arcade Ball is, uh, hopefully we can kind of grow a bit. And there are, there are a few companies out there that um, we're contacting they actually market to mobile carriers around the world. And so another stream of income might be um, 
giving it to one of the, they're essentially publishers, but instead of publishing to consumers, they publish to um, big businesses that, that might be interested in posting it on their carrier store or whatever. So I, I think there's there's promise in, in getting multiple revenue, multiple streams of revenue for Arcade Ball. And that'll be just a nice steady, steady stream of income. So overall, the lessons we've learned, um, selling currency is greater than selling content. And um, this is something that if, if you were to really research the freemium model, uh, this is something that is pretty well established, but it was nice to kind of see it, hard data in front of me. Ad surprisingly worked a lot better than I expected. And um, really diversifying revenue pays off because if you were to take any single stream of revenue, it's significantly less than all, what is it, I think 11 streams that we have when we take all the SKUs into consideration, all the prize packs. Um, it, it just all adds up. A lot of little, a lot of small streams add up to be um, something more significant. So as we're working on Ski Ball 2, um, future improvements, um, like I said, it's, the, the, the tickets and the prizes are not very well tied to the central goal of the game, and therefore I think in-app principles aren't very compelling to the users right now. So our goal is to make it more of a central part of the game. Um, for Tickets are going to play a more central role, and although you're not going to have to buy tickets, it's one of those things where some people might want to save time and buy tickets. Um, and uh, I think that, that more or less sums it up. And the reason I wanted to talk about this is because this now applies to the new game that we're really excited about called Jump Dudes, and I'll jump back to Ty here. Uh, MobClix actually offers a nice feature where you can put your own ads in there. And so you can cross-promote your own apps. Um, and we, we have done that to some extent. That's actually more free versus, um, under free versus control. But when we self-publish some of these upcoming games, we're definitely going to be doing that. And once I have statistics on that and conversion rate, I'd love to share it. Um, you know, I should have taken a screenshot because it, it is kind of hard to explain. Essentially, yeah, from a user's perspective in Ski Ball, at, on the title screen there's a Get Free Tickets button. So you click Get Free Tickets and the, this offer wall comes up with a list of apps you can download from the App Store or from the Android Marketplace. Um, and if you download one of these apps, you get free tickets. Like you're, you're given free tickets. And uh, every time, from a, from a developer's perspective, if I want to put my app on the TapJoy wall, and it's actually a very effective way to artificially raise yourself on the charts, which is why Apple banned it. But if, if you happen to have a lot of money to spare, um, you can, you can and that's what a lot of these bigger companies are doing. You can really launch yourself in the charts. So uh, on the TapJoy back end, I, I say, for every time somebody clicks on this offer, I want to pay 35 cents. And um, it just kind of ends up being a bidding war. So the people who put a higher bid on their, on their app end up being higher on the, on the TapJoy wall. And, and obviously, it's it's uh, it's not really shady, but it's yeah, it's shady. I mean, <laughs> I mean, so I, so big publishers obviously have the upper hand here because it's like we may not have you know ten thousand dollars to throw at making this game popular, but if Zynga wants to promote their their app, they're like yeah, ten thousand dollars, no problem. Make it twenty thousand, we'll be in the top charts, no problem. And so you're essentially buying your way to the top. And it was working so well that Apple banned it. And I, I honestly thought uh, 
one of the Android marketplaces banned it, but we're still using it, so. <laughs> You offer tickets when people do that? Yep. Does that include, like, follow us on Facebook? Can you get 50 tickets and stuff like that, too? It does not. Okay. Yeah, no, not. Is that different than the one that Zynga uses? Um, I think the one Zynga uses is probably internal. Well, I'm, think, I'm sorry. I'm thinking of uh, Roxy Mobile or something like that. Yeah. Or no, that's not it. Never mind. Can I see a question? Yeah, I was curious. I know It was all using Unity and deployed from Unity for all platforms. And it was, we, I mean, it was actually starting before Unity 2.5. We were using an old version of Unity 1.7 and, and over the years uh, upgraded it. And that, that proved to be some challenges in itself. But it, was, it was more or less pretty easy. There was some, some stuff like the, the TapJoy wall and the mob clicks functionality, we had to write some custom plugins for Unity. And working with a Unity plugin, which then exports to an Xcode project, um, some, it ended up being kind of a nightmare with the Android project because that code would, would break stuff when building out to Android. And so we had to end up doing special cases if building out for this. And there was just, um, the game was kind of a Franken project after two years. It, it really was not, very concisely made and you know, organized very well. So it, it ended up being kind of a nightmare. But as time goes on, Unity has developers that are selling plugins for stuff like ModClicks and TapJoy and makes it a lot easier. And as Ty said, that they're actually going to be supporting in Unity itself now, not having to make plugins, stuff like uh, social network features. And I'm thinking that might include, and I'm really hoping that includes stuff like ModClicks. Something like that. All right, jump dudes. We're gonna get kind of silly in here. Uh, bear with me. Uh, so this is our new project. Um, it's our new IP. It's kind of built around what we learned from Ski Ball on how to how to you know do in-app purchases and everything. Um, came from a prototype earlier this summer. Uh, this project was, for the most part, um, me and uh, Forrest Johnson. He was our, he's our summer guy. He comes to bust out some awesome games for three months and then go away until next year. <laughs> but um, so this is um, probably just going to have to show you this game because it, it's, let's see. So, Essentially, the game is about a volcanic island out in the middle of the ocean called Duda Wonton. And the native little guys that you saw earlier are called dudes. And um, their island is on a big, it's a big volcano that has all this buried pirate treasure underneath. And when the volcano erupts, all the treasure flies up along with lava. It falls down, and they try to grab all the coins to spend it on insane parties that they like to have on their island. Um, so there are these, these hyper little guys. Um, so the, uh, let's see. So the game, like the game mechanic here is that you run, oh man, resolution is not quite there. Uh, that's fine. Um, so, <laughs> You kind of run back and forth on this platform. I'll just show you here. Um, so let me grab a, a dude here. Let's be, uh, I like this guy, Bingle Dairy. All right, so all the levels are unlocked, all the content's unlocked here, so it's gonna be kind of crazy. Um, let's go to the Dudeberry Forest. All right, so. Um, it'll be on an iPhone, you tilt and tap to jump. All the characters are unique, they all have different double jumps. Um, you can see stuff starting to fall down. Uh, so you want to grab the coins, but if you let the f coins hit the ground, they start to crack the ground, as you can kind of see there. 
So you're trying to grab as many coins as you can, and if you let the coin hit the ground there, you can see it starts cracking. Now, obviously, with all that lava underneath, you don't want the ground to crack. Uh, here's a power up here, a vortex. It kind of sucks all the coins in there for you. You can grab them all. There's that part. Okay. So um, the game just kind of gets faster and faster as you try to um, grab all these coins and not fall into lava. And there, here's a uh, flew out of the screen. So the game's still a little buggy. It's kind of in beta right now, um, or almost to beta. Let me wait for this power. Here's a my little buddy is second grab. They help me grab coins. Here's a ham that makes you kind of fat, and I can't jump. <laughs> So it's, uh, it just gets kind of crazy with all these coins falling and all these power-ups and power-downs and the, the ground changes and there's these giant volcanic rocks that, that uh, immediately put a hole in the ground, like that one, no, that one missed. And then um, eventually you'll get these little ground pieces that um, will replace the ground. They're uh, rigid bodies, so if they land on the ground, you can push them around into wherever, you know, like a hole that you want to. Show you another level real quick. Grab a different guy here. Um, what's the magnet so, do? What's that? What's the magnet do? The magnet there uh, so <laughs> magnetizes everything to the dude. There's um, there's different ones like a coin rain where all the coins fly from the side and they don't hit the ground so you can kind of jump and get them. There's the vortex that sucks them all in. Actually, I think they're all right here. Nope. I need an unlocked dude. Um, I'll show you some of the characters here, but um, you can scroll through, scroll through here and upgrade all the power-ups. Um, there's another store where you can buy more currency. Um, so all these different dudes have to have double jumps. Like he has like a teleport kind of thing. Um, here's the dude vicious. He kind of rocks out in his double jump. Um, and there's the pirate. He's got a huge jump. This guy's kind of cool. He makes his own platforms, and then he can then jump off of that. Uh, the dude 2.0, got a little rocket boost there. Um, I like this guy with the nunchucks, he kind of floats in the air. Uh, one more cool one. Right. <laughs> I, I love them all, all, all my little kids. Um, How many people worked on this? What's that? How many people worked on this? Um, for the most part, two. I think everyone's kind of touched it at one point at the office, but uh, we started this in like May, maybe June, I think. Um, Recently, just you saw all the other games we're working on at the same time, so I hasn't been full time on it. But um, uh, so there's all these different dudes. I'll show you one more level. I'll be the Bubsy guy here. Oh, just real quick, one more big thing. Uh, we also have multiplayer. So on the iPhone, you can connect over Wi-Fi and play in real time against each other in the same level, jumping off each other, trying to get as many coins as you can. First one to kind of fill their bar up wins. And it's, it, it's pretty cool. Um, there's not a lot of games like that on the iPhone that I've seen that um, you have that direct interaction with someone online. Um, so the levels get pretty crazy here. I'll Is that about like them wager against each other? Uh, no, actually, that's uh, kind of like that. Yeah. Spend your uh, so the coins that you get translate um, into these uh, rubies, R E W B I E, sticking with the the E W thing in there, um, and that's what you use for currency to buy stuff. But just kind of showing you, like all they all have different jumps, and some of them we tried to balance it so that they um, they're not necessarily better; they're just different, I guess. So, which is actually kind of difficult. Um, there's some advanced techniques like jumping off the wall that's kind of like a secret thing. Uh, I got a little sound there, sorry about that. Not the final uh, songs or anything, but it helps. So, um, let me show you a, a really crazy level. So you can see there the coins translate into rubies, you have your best high score, you jump next to the store or whatever. Um, let's grab this dude. Yeah, it, it's kind of, yeah, it's buggy. Alright, so here I'll show you this one. This one's my favorite level. <laughs> I'm so excited about this. Alright. Um, 
So this, uh, one of the characters is the rocker guy in the band back there. And this actually, it's not animated right now, I'm sorry. It, the, in the project, it's all animated back there. You know what? Anyway, uh, I'll show you the animated one. Uh, so, uh, hmm. That's enough. <laughs> So that, that's that's that game right now. I'll jump back to it and, and uh, show you the um, as we go through the uh, PowerPoint here. Sorry, one sec. It's worth it. Hold on. That is so not worth it. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I forgot there's a little bug going on right now. Um, okay, anyway, back to the um, back to the presentation. All right, so that was a little taste of Jump Dudes. Um, so in the game, uh, purchasables with your rubies that you collect, um, the coins kind of translate into rubies at a. I think right now we're trying out a ten to one ratio just to deal with smaller numbers. Um, you can buy characters with your rubies. You can buy new. All the power ups are locked in the beginning, so you kind of like, if you can't beat a level, you know, get some rubies and you can buy these different power ups. I had everything in there, so it was kind of crazy to understand what was going on. But once you unlock them and progress, you'll, you know, understand that as a player. Um, you can unlock the levels. Um, you can buy more rubies in ruby packs in the game. Um, if you're if you're hurting, you know, buy a thousand rubies. You can get a couple characters or whatever. Um, now, two new things that we're trying with this game. Um, we have these boosts. EW again. Uh, so these are temporary power ups that um, you would um, you would um, pay for and would help you for possibly 24 hours, or we're not quite sure yet. Um, so, you know, you can, um, these are some of the ones we're trying, you know, like get double rubies for a day, get, uh, you know, stronger ground. Um, we're, we're like uh, the VIP package, no more ads and double rubies. Um, just trying some different stuff out, kind of uh, see if people are interested in, I guess. Um, and then we're also, the uh, last thing we're trying out is this um, revive. So testing out timed impulse purchases on the iPhone. So when you fall into the lava, your character pops up, and this, this screen pops up, and it says, buy a revive, three, two, one. Click it, and it'll bring you right back to the... Um, to where you were in the game so you can progress. The revives are paid for by rubies. They're not like, we're not like, hey, give us 99 cents real quick. That, you know, yeah. <laughs> so they're paid by, with your in-game currency. So um, I don't think I've seen any any kind of timed impulse stuff like that on, on the iPhone, I guess, so we're gonna try that out. You should make the cost go up slowly if they would just wait. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there you go. I like that. So they need to know at that, that first click down if they're going to do it or not. Yeah. Wait. So, I don't, you know, just, just trying some different stuff out. It's been really experimental this year, kind of seeing what, what hits and what works and with all that. Um, we're going to try a free and paid version, um, try the ads thing, have three characters available, um, normal, normal rubies. Um, and in the paid version, ooh, if, uh, if you want to upgrade, um, you'll get no ads. There'll be five unlocked characters at the beginning, and we'll give you double the rubies. So it's a little more incentive to try to get the paid version. Um, again, another 
pass the line out, see, see if that see if that works. Um, yeah. One thing that I, I didn't note during the ski ball slides, but the free and paid versions on the iOS, at, at least, I can't speak for the Android, seem to be in very different universes. An individual, it seems like they either shop exclusively free or exclusively paid. And uh, there's not really much overlap that I've, for, with everything that I've found. And the, our publisher, Freeverse, um, is very convinced of this too. So that, that's just an interesting fact. I don't think it's going to hurt anything to put a free and a paid version out there, even if it's, um, I mean, you have, you, there's obviously some incentive here with the paid version, but uh, you, even if, like with ski ball, there's, there's really not much incentive between the two versions, and I don't think that's really going to hurt us because the, the two, the free and paid universes are just so, so separate, it seems. Yeah, no, no, it's nice. Um, so yeah, that's Jump Dudes. Um, we're shooting for possibly right after holiday season on that one. Um, so the, the question was, that if, if we have the free version and you buy the paid version, does stuff transfer? And uh, we did that with um, with Ski Ball. It ended up being really a development nightmare because it's using the keychain sharing, which is just really clunky, I guess. It's, it's really hard. Really, what it comes down to is it's hard to test because now instead of one SKU, you have two SKUs to test. And in our case, I think we had, we, we tried sharing between iPad and iPhone, which never worked out. Um, but one really promising thing now is iCloud. Um, it's possible to save preferences in the cloud, which means it's going to make it a lot easier to do, hopefully, make it a lot easier to do free to paid, and then also um, iPhone to iPad and being able to share preferences. I guess we have yet to see if that's actually going to work out, though. I don't know, I don't know how preferences are really saved in the cloud right now. I don't know if it's by... Um, I don't know if it might essentially be the same as keychain sharing, where they have to share the bundle identifier, or I, you know, I really don't know. That's also part of uh, that's part of why the VIP package in there you can upgrade to get rid of the ads, also and save all your save all your stuff. Um, I do remember what I was going to say. I have iPads and iPods and all that good stuff with Jump Dudes on there. If anyone wants to check it out. Give it a shot. Let me know. Uh, I could definitely use the testing and feedback right now. If anyone's interested. Um, <laughs> here's our Apple teaser for this holiday. We haven't used Open Faint, um, but are very aware that it's like it's heavily used out there. I mean, definitely open to it. Um, you know, jump dudes or something. We're using Game Center right now, but I think um, you know probably wouldn't hurt to, to use it. Oh, so, uh, Open Faint is kind of a social. Um, has like uh, achievements, social stuff. It's kind of like a thing you add on to your game. Yeah, you could probably explain this more technically than I could <laughs> as, a, as the artist. Um, but uh, it just kind of tracks your achievements and progress, and you can be social and stuff, and just kind of add uh, t attaches to your game. Hours. Um, Oh, uh, we do have a ski, uh, ski ball and Gravic Facebook page. Um, our Twitter is just Gravic. Um, we get a lot of feedback. We actually did a contest or uh, 
would you call it a contest? The contest last year, drawing for skee ball players. Um, we gave away three iPod touches. Um, so, uh, got a lot of followers from that. And I uh, gave away a bunch of uh, crazy skee ball prizes, like little finger traps and stuff. It was kind of funny. Um, so, follow us on Twitter because we like to do that kind of stuff. Um, Gravic or Gravic Tie. Yes, please, yes, sir. So we use Milton's Paint in uh, some of our games, and basically it's sort of like another game center that uh, preceded Apple Game Center. It gives you an in-game chat client, which no one's interested in, in-game forms, which are also not very interesting, but it tracks achievements and uh, provides global high scores. So we got our global high scores and cran ball out of it, and I think that's what people were kind of interested in. It didn't really help. Uh, us at all with sales or promotions, like we thought that maybe, oh, the only reason people aren't buying our game is because it doesn't have open faint or, you know, the social kind of aspects in it. But uh, it didn't really help us there. They have some cross-promotional stuff in there as well, where you can, where you share with your friends what apps you really like, and then uh, you can buy, you, you know, they'll redirect you to other games and things like that. Um, so that's kind of the idea behind the open faint and uh, at least our experiences with it. We, we have experience not with open faint but with plus plus, which is open faint's competitor. And I should say was open faint's competitor because plus plus is now more or less dead. Um, Free versus our publisher, they had a good relationship with NG Moco, who created the plus plus um, network, and then Free versus bought out by. Mogo. And so then, of course, Plus Plus had to be in everything. And we hated it because it didn't do anything for us and it was, uh, it was hard to implement with Unity. And then uh, NG Moco, who bought out Freeverse, then was bought out by this, um, this Japanese company called DNA. And now Plus Plus is more or less dead because they think it's a terrible idea. <laughs> so. So, so I think as far as the, the different routes to go for the achievements and uh, global high scores or Game Center and Open Faint, and I guess the advantage of Open Faint is cross-platform. Game Center is unfortunately on iOS, so it's totally relevant on any Android ports. Honestly, it may have, <laughs> it may have accidentally been removed. You know, it's like, whoops, I didn't notice it. Did you just didn't notice it. You know, I, I don't even know anymore. It might still be there. I don't know. It's not going to be the next version. <laughs> you, you had a slide up there, a little cut back of uh, the different ways you were thinking of uh, selling things and the dues and the junk dues. Yeah. Um, how are you going to determine which ones to do? You were saying, well, we don't know which ones are going to ask. We have this. How, what, how are you doing this? Um, just trying out the feeling. Oh yeah, go ahead. I think I think the big thing that we want to do with this project versus Ski Ball is a lot more metrics tracking. So first of all, we're going to put more Flurry analytics um, stuff in here, so we get to track this stuff more. Because even though we did learn a lot from Ski Ball, as you can tell, there's still a lot of experimental stuff. We have no idea if it's actually going to sell. I think. One thing that we have going for us is that a lot of these are consumable versus permanent content unlocked. And then um, I think one thing that it's not finalized what we were talking about, having these rotate in the store so we don't always have them all there. We want to, we're always going to have Ruby packs for sale because those are big sellers. But instead of overwhelming them with five choices and maybe even more, we're going to have kind of a constant rotation in the store, which can help us determine what's actually selling well. So, so your sort of thinking is, the more of these, the better. And we'll rotate them through, and then we'll, we'll track them. to come back and see we'll track them and see which ones are doing good. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. Guess, guess what? The ones that don't move this, this, this period yeah. are oh, very sure. cool, very cool. And it's, it's really exciting because, I mean, some of these, are, I think, are actually sound a lot of fun. Yeah, I, I, we really like to try to not have the in-app purchases be intrusive. 
and I guess one thing that I want to make really clear is that nobody has to buy anything to beat the game, and that's really important. It's, it's mostly just, we're going to make your life easier if you want to give us money. <laughs> but, but certainly we don't want to limit content. In, in, the, in the slide right after this, that whole buying, rebuy, that's just, that's really... <laughs> well, we'll see. I mean, how many times have you said there's, like, I give you nipples, not a time, right? <laughs> Insert quarter here. Yeah, yeah exactly. Right. Have you guys thought about any sort of like A/B testing, where like you know you pick, you pick a random number that's associated with the device somehow, like the UDID or something, and like half the people get um, like rotating things that they can buy, and the other half get you know like a full list and see which ends up working better. Or it's a good yeah, idea. Yeah, yeah. I mean for like impulsive stuff like that, and you can test it. You know, you have something to test against for like it's actually working. Yes. So, um, as you're playing, there's a little bar, a little wave bar. As you fill it up by grabbing coin, when you grab a coin, it fills up. When you miss a coin, it goes down a little bit. So you fill it up, you beat that wave, and it gets faster. And then on the level select screen, which everything is unlocked, so it's probably pretty unclear. Um, the uh, the levels are unlocked once you pass wave ten. Right now, still kind of testing that out, but pass wave ten or a hundred rupees or whatever. So you have the option of eating the level, or I really want to play the fifth level. I'll just pay some money or whatever. Yeah. So. Because the final level has some kind of special thing at the end. The final level is is. Um, yeah, it's, it's really crazy. It's a screen full of coins, and it's totally possible to beat it. It's more about, like, this is the final level. It's really full of particles and crap everywhere, and, and um, you beat it, and you're rewarded with the end screen of the, all the cute characters frolicking and playing and yeah, partying, actually. Um, and then you can restart, and all the levels are going to be in a hard mode now. So you can go back and you can play the first level, but just as crazy as the last level. So that... Um, you know, once you pass the first level, you're not going to not never going to play the first level again. It's too easy. So. And we have we have um, plans for you know more levels. We we do the uh, the um, iTunes album swipey thingy, so you can just throw new levels in, throw new characters in, and um, yeah, that's fine. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's kind of it's kind of a man versus environment thing, where like the enemy is the coins, but they're also your friend, and the, <laughs> the lava is your enemy. But you know, yeah, yeah. And we're we're always you know thinking of new power ups and new power downs or whatever. And, and the way yeah. you get is that you can drop anything you want. Yeah. Um, <laughs> right. That's sort of the fun of these toys you're showing. You know, it's like, yeah, it's stuck, pop it down. Yeah. Pop down a, you pop down a boss. Yeah, pretty much anything. Kitchen sink. Yeah, yeah that's cool. Like, Would you guys ever consider a company to pay you to put in a power up that's branded, like, drop your Coke bottle for yeah. a box? <laughs> Burger King yeah, guy so, is a character. Uh, it, it depends what it is, I guess, yeah. <laughs> yeah, probably <laughs> in, in, in scrolling. If it's not too ridiculous, I mean, I don't know, maybe, uh, if we get to do it on a Coke can, maybe. When DreamWorks gets sick of Angry Birds and making a movie about dropping things from the Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I can totally see plushies on these guys. Yeah. Oh, there will be, there will be yeah. plushies <laughs> in the office. That's another thing. Can you just talk a little bit about what your roles are at the company? And, and by the way, I love the like, Um, I'm the creative director, I'm like the artist, designer, game designer, gameplay, do art, 3D. more or less ties in the game. I don't get a big deal that. No, they're really cool, they're really cool. Thanks. And what do you do, sir? Um, I, I kind of fill in a lot of random cracks and do day-to-day -day business stuff, as well as, I, I started in Grabac as, Artist, but uh, I really 
never rarely do art anymore. And I just kind of do day to day business stuff. And I, kind of miss, I kind of miss the actual development side, but, but I still get, get my hands dirty quite a bit. And then Jajib sitting over there, he's an uh, artist and he's doing really well with us and Ty's doing some awesome works. So, and this is mostly Ty's idea, the Jump Dude's idea. Um, I don't know where he comes up with these ideas, but when he was explaining to me coins shooting on a volcano that destroys the ground with lava on any, I mean, I don't even know, how much coffee were you on? I think it was, was like it a coffee? airport layover that oh, was way too long or something. <laughs> How much are you going to charge for your like power ups and stuff like that? Um, pretty much everything in the game except for those boost things are going to be you can buy with the in game currency. So if you're running, that, I, we don't know the exact numbers of you know balance all the store out, but everything you can you don't have to pay for. You can play the game. You can earn it. Okay. Yeah, you can earn it and. Uh, really pushing it towards buying the currency and the player having the freedom to spend it on what they want, not just us telling them, you get this. For a dollar, okay. Yeah, so. Well, thought I just had is if you really had that wheel, you could do the take a gamble thing where it just spins the wheel for a certain price and you might get rich and yeah. you might not. That's we have, uh, there, there's another uh, uh, possibility, too, of like a daily lotto thing. To be, when you, the first time you play each day, you kind of spin it and get a free 10 tickets, something to keep the player coming back, especially if they have the free version with ads, you know, we want that come back and play more, you know, so. Or a multiplier. Yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah. With uh, the skee-ball, our philosophy was let's give them a stupid amount of tickets, like a stupidly good amount of tickets, because it's the, like I said before, the content, like it, it's not that compelling for the user to buy tickets right now because we don't have that much that actually changes the game. And so we ended up giving them 20,000 tickets for 99 cents, which you can buy quite a bit of stuff. And uh, I really think that works worked with us pretty well because, I mean, really that's a dollar or 70 cents, whatever, that we wouldn't have gotten otherwise. And so let's just, let's just be extra nice about it, just like, just give them a bunch of tickets. And, and I think that's a philosophy we probably want to carry over with junk dudes. We don't want to be stingy. Like, if they're giving us money, like, just, we'll, we'll pile on the rubies. That's fine. Um, and it's, I think uh, one of the biggest questions of ours with this project right now is balancing the currency system. I think we have a pretty big task ahead of us, just like figuring out what to price everything. Because we, we really have no experience with the complex Currency such as this. Ski ball is pretty simple. It's like we have prizes. Prizes are generally this much money. All right, so how much? And then we make an average person can make roughly this many tickets per game. All right, with that information, we can get a pretty good idea of what we're going to sell tickets for. But with this, we have a lot more items and just a lot more unlockable content that I have no idea how we're, we're going to balance this. So if anybody has any ideas. Yeah, regarding pricing and monetization, one thing that I've read repeatedly is that users call models, which are people are people who are willing to drop you know fifty dollars on an in-app purchase, and that can comprise a pretty large amount of, of a pretty substantial proportion of the income that you'll end up with. These people who will drop insane amounts of money on in-app purchases, so you really are, you, to, to get the full benefit from that, you have to cater, you know, just a little bit. Make sure you know you can buy a hundred thousand rubies for fifty bucks, and have at least something there that they would plausibly be able to spend any on. Okay. Yeah, like the uh, the four hundred dollars Smurf berry pack. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>
and uh, or you can also buy gear. But they've done a really good job of selling. I mean, uh, one thing that made us want to do a game like this is because uh, we're, it's our philosophy to try to balance making money like business and also good game design. And then we, we come up with, with ideas that we want to make a lot. But then we ask ourselves, should we, should we make this? Because is it actually going to make this money? And I, I hope this is a nice marriage of the two good game design. Also, just gather a lot of information by looking at the top throws and the top papers. The two lists are completely different on the iOS, where in the top grossing, it's all about premium, it's all about um, farm clothes. <laughs> <laughs> not that there's anything about farm clothes, I just But uh, in the top paid list, there are games like Cut the Rope and Angry Birds, Fruit Ninja, which are really good games. But but it's so risky because the chances of getting up on the top 10 for the pay charts are really, really low, I think, where going a, a route like this where it's monetized in multiple ways can hopefully provide a stream of income without having to be on the charts. And I guess we'll, we'll see if that's true, but um, I guess it's only one way to find out. It's working okay with it. Indications are, are good with arcade ball. Even though we're not getting a huge amount of, of an audience for that, we're still having someone to trip away. 